I'm Matt Pillar. This is the Business of Biotech. And my guest today is repeat biopharma entrepreneur, Dr. My Britt Zoka, who's currently CEO of the company she founded that's developing novel immunomodulating cancer therapies designed to induce the in immune system to simultaneously target and disrupt multiple pathways that regulate tumor-induced immunosuppression. The company is IO Biotech. And it's got a deep pipeline of phase one and phase two candidates addressing melanoma and solid tumors of the lung, head, neck, and bladder. Dr. Zoka joins me today from Copenhagen, where she earned her PhD in medicine and where she spent much of her fast rising life sciences career to date. And today we're going to get to know Dr. Zoka, hear a bit about her career and how it shaped her leadership of IO Biotech. And we're going to learn a little bit about the company's unique immune oncology platform. Uh, Dr. Zoka, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. I'm glad we could make it happen. Uh, and I, as I said, I want to get to know you a little bit before we kind of get into the, the, the conversation around IO Biotech and its science. Um, and I want to start with your name. So, you know, when I first learned of the opportunity to spend some time with you, uh, the first thing obviously that struck me was was your name, My Brit. For those of you listening and, and not seeing this on screen, M A I hyphen B R I T T Zoka. So, what is that? It's a, it's a beautiful name. It's interesting. <laughs> what what is there a story behind that? It, it, it may be totally common in in in, in Copenhagen. I don't know. No, so my first name is actually not uncommon here, but it has a special uh, way of spelling. So I do have to spell it every time that uh, people need to make a note of it because there's multiple ways that you can spell it. And I guess my parents chose the most difficult way. Uh, and then my husband is Italian. I brought him, uh, he lived in New York. I brought him back to Denmark after his 10 years in New York. So. Uh, I granted him uh, the opportunity to give me an Italian last name. So that's the combination. It's a common Danish first name, but an Italian uh, last name. Uh, okay. So, so yeah. my, my Brit is, is common. It's a common Danish first name. It is a common uh, Danish first name, but we are only four suckers uh, in Denmark. So uh, that uh, is uh, an honor to my husband. Yeah. Very nice. Very, yeah. very good. Good. Well, yeah, that answers that question for me. Yeah. Um, so I want I want I want to talk a little bit about your uh, your career trajectory because the other thing that strikes me, you know, once I get past the name, uh, looking at your career trajectory on on paper, um, you know, you earned your PhD at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, you worked as a patent consultant for a short time. Did some T cell immunology research at Herlev University for a year or so. Uh, then you joined cancer vaccine developer Dan Dritt biotech. And th that's when things, at least again, on, on paper kind of accelerated for you uh, in what, just five years time, I think you rose from the ranks of production manager to CSO, and then uh, eventually made your way, way into the, into the CEO suite there, CEO office that is um, in, in just, you know, five years after receiving your PhD in medicine. So I, I want to dig into that a little bit. Like the big, the big question is how, how do you make that happen? How do you go from, you know, earning your PhD to kind of accelerating through your career to become the CEO of, of Dandrit in, in just five years? Yeah. So that was definitely not how I had written out my career myself. So I actually did my PhD uh, years as a combination of spending time at the NCI NIH in, in the U S Mm -hmm. Very exciting time, very uh, proud of joining and being a part of Steve Rosenberg's lab uh, back then. That was definitely uh, some foundational years uh, for me. And coming back to Denmark, I really brought back uh, some tools that I had learned there uh, that was not uh, common uh, uh, in Copenhagen at that time. So joining the team out of Herle University, I, I really thought that that was where I was going to be and spend my time uh, uh, forever, kind of, uh, after I had in done a, a short, yeah, in Copenhagen, after I had done a, a short sprint at uh, a patent uh, office. Then I was, uh, you know, somebody came and knocked on the door and talked to me about uh, this uh, spin out that they had created, uh, spinning out from the 
cancer society here in uh, Copenhagen and really going around the field that I had uh, learned about during my time, uh, my PhD years at uh, NIH, uh, NCI. So that was completely exciting, uh, very interesting. And uh, coming in with uh, fresh energy, the right background from my PhD and uh, a very early uh, spin out. I, I guess I just fitted the purpose at the right time and uh, with the right background. I never thought I, at that time that I was any time near to become a CEO of a company, mm -hmm. but uh, they really saw that in me uh, as a good leader, a strong leader of uh, first creating the scientific uh, or research lab. Uh, I built it up that in record uh, time and then, uh, yeah. I, I was appointed CSO or uh, given the challenge one day and it came uh, as a surprise. I slept, I woke up and I said yes. Uh, and the same happened the year after when they then were ready to uh, appoint me as CEO. I was like, oh my God, no, I'm not ready for that. Uh, I went home and the day after I said yes. And yeah, basically I haven't looked back. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, that uh, journey uh, and I have enjoyed it ever since. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome. I want to unpack that just a little bit, a couple, couple of yeah. follow-up questions on that. So you, you mentioned that when you came to the to the States and you spent some time with uh, NIH, NIH, NCI, uh, you felt when you returned to Denmark, you, you were equipped with some, some tools, I think was the word that you used yeah. um, that, that would kind of help you and, and also maybe help the, the biotech community in, in, in Denmark. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Like what, what sort of tools, how, how did you, what was it uh, specifically that made you feel better equipped to return to Denmark and-, and Yeah, so, so obviously the US at that time was, was really uh, far ahead of uh, what we were doing here in Denmark in terms of the field that is now called and very well respected immuno-oncology. So uh, I was uh, doing a PhD in translational research. I learned uh, uh, how to do immune monitoring of uh, cancer patients entering into clinical trials. So really a translational uh, basic research program that I brought uh, with me home. So it was more uh, a matter of getting the tools to how to view uh, the uh, immune uh, responses in patients being treated, treated with uh, immunotherapies. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then the, the second follow question on, on that, uh, that first note about your uh, meteoric rise to the, the C-suite. Mm -hmm. um, what specifically, you know, when you were when you were tapped on the shoulder and asked to fill into the CEO, your your first CEO role at a very young age at Dandrit, uh, and, and you said, you know, your initial response was, "No, I'm I'm not ready." Um, what what uh, I guess felt the least prepared in in my Brit to accept that responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, so scientifically, I, I felt very strong. This was in my sweet spot. So, uh, and I had built the, the research group there. And also uh, I was very heavily involved in our clinical programs. We did uh, several phase two trials in this company during my uh, time. So uh, I was not at all prepared for the financial aspect of uh, building a company mm -hmm. uh, and especially not such a, a young company. Uh, so uh, we made an agreement with the previous uh, CEO that she would uh, join me uh, on the side from the board. Uh, and and uh, while I was on the learning curve, uh, yeah. Well, she, I mean, that must've been a, a terrific experience and one that really stuck with you because I'm, I'm gonna ask you later on when we get into the IO biotech story about a, a pretty uh, spectacular um series B that you guys just, just did uh, last year that, that was successful. So you, you must've picked up the financial aspects pretty quickly there, my Brett. Um, <laughs> yeah. What is the, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, back when you did your time at the NIH and, and um, NCI uh, that, that the U S FDA was perhaps a, a bit ahead of uh, where, where things were in Denmark. What is the scene now in Denmark? I'm just curious what the biotech scene looks like there. Is there a, a growing or bustling bio biotech or, there is definitely. I, I mean, it's it's really fantastic. I'm I'm so thrilled when I think back on how it looked those many years ago and where we are now. There is a lively scene. There is so many companies. There is uh, definitely a better opportunity or chance to get funded uh, here, and there is really a strong uh, foundation and network. It's it's built and it's grown and. 
I'm really just proud to be a part of uh, where we are now uh, as well as a, as a community, biotech community. I think we yeah. stand very strong when you look uh, throughout the world. Uh, yeah. And you, you know, again, just looking at your, your career on paper, you've, you've, you, uh, it's apparent that you personally are, are, are invested in, in the area. I mean, obviously it's home, but uh, it, mm. it's, it's clear, it's clear that you're invested in, in the area. And one of the, you know, one of the, I guess, uh, um, hallmarks of that investment of, of, of yourself in the area was that after Dan Dritt, you, you ran the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial learning lab uh, at yeah. Simpson on Science Park for, for a few years uh, before turning back to emerging biotech. So uh, I'm curious about that too. You, you ran this entrepreneurial learning lab and uh, you know, this is coming off your first experience as a, uh, as CEO of a, of a biopharma. Um, what, what did that experience, how did that kind of help prepare you for entrepreneurship of, of your own? Like, what did you, what did you learn? What did you take away from that experience? Maybe learn from other uh, founders that you've taken with you. Yeah. So uh, that there is no, I, I mean, we are, we are trying to learn if there's one rule that fits all and that that's a hard game, right? So that was a part of what the entrepreneurial learning lab was about. It was trying to really, look at a lot of data and trying to see what is really the, the key points that make uh, the turning points uh, in building companies. And it was both among tech companies and also uh, life sciences. And tech companies might, as we know, have a different trajectory. Uh, it's more difficult with, uh, with life sciences and especially for therapeutic uh, companies. So it was a great time, but it's also, it's a very difficult field uh, to, uh, to write uh, general rules and, and, and dig it down on, on paper, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I broadened up uh, very dramatic my network uh, during those years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's, uh, you know, to go from uh, that, you know, it, it admittedly, I guess, apprehensive acceptance of the CEO position at Dandre to by 2012, uh, you know, or, or since 2012, just pretty much nonstop founding, um, yeah. you know, acting as CEO, you're, you, you serve on several boards now. Um, you, you, you clearly embraced the entrepreneurial side of the business. Uh, what do you think fuels that drive? What, what, what's kind of behind that? Um, yeah. I, I guess, so the early days at Dendrit where I was given the opportunity really uh, gave me uh, the insight that I was a good leader. Uh, I was able to motivate and, and drive passion throughout uh, the team I was uh, collecting around me at that time. Some of the people at iBiotech actually comes all the way back uh, from when we started working first time at uh, and Dendrit. So that also speaks to uh, how we work together. And it was really uh, a fantastic uh, learning for all of us and, and growing that company. Um, I'm driven by the early uh, phases of really building and, and pulling through value that ultimately will reach uh, patients, meaningful new drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a strong passion and that goes all the way back to my uh, PhD uh, years at NIH NCI to do this in the field of immuno-oncology. I think it's tremendous value that we can uh, drive here uh, with safety and non-toxic uh, drugs, uh, bringing that forward uh, to do really changes for cancer patients. And then, you know, now I've learned what uh, we can do for shareholders. I also enjoy uh, bringing value back to uh, shareholders that take the risk together with us as a team uh, to invest in the, in the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that, that sort of leads us up to the launch of, of IO biotech in, in 2015. So uh, how'd the company come to be? How, how, how give, give us the Genesis story. Yeah. So, so really the, the company is built uh, with some of my early uh, uh, day network. So uh, one of the other founders, uh, key founders of iBiotech, I work with her. It's Professor Ingmarie Svane. I work with her already during my PhD uh, in, uh, time uh, in, uh, at the university in Copenhagen. And it, it, it was also in her lab that I started uh, when I came back for, at the university hospital uh, here in Copenhagen. 
So it was easy to uh, build the company with her and also my other key co-founder, um, S. Hal Andersen, who really have driven all the uh, patent and the uh, main ideas for our scientific uh, and technology platform. We sat down 2014, looked at the data they had generated uh, in an early trial. That was really exciting. They had seen a clear benefit uh, of this uh, technology in patients they had treated only 15 patients but nevertheless really great data mm -hmm. we started you know brainstorming around uh, uh, how we could bring this together and uh, build a company and we made uh, also some headlines that this should be a global company uh, and we should uh, be a company where we had uh, not only one target but a platform technology and also no close competitors uh, in the Danish landscape, at least uh, that uh, that could uh, uh, yeah, uh, drive uh, competition here locally. And I'm very proud of where we are uh, today. So now seven, eight years later, we, we really have hold the promise. We are a global player. We have uh, offices in four different places in the world, Copenhagen in the UK, two uh, places in uh, in US as well, and uh, we recently uh, did our uh, Nasdaq IPO in uh, in New York, and we are very close uh, to also deliver on our promise with uh, bringing uh, drug candidates forward to uh, to the patients in need with a phase three trial. Yeah. So yeah. it it really builds on a network that I had from uh, early days, a technology that was just there with data, and then a team that uh, really came together and. Uh, yeah, shaked hand on the same uh, promise. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and we'll. Uh, so yeah, in, j in just those few years, the the pipeline has grown significantly and, and matured. So I've got some questions for you around that. But um, as I alluded to earlier, when I was commenting on your, you know, kind of uh, d in disbelief on your um, hesitancy around the financial aspects of, of the business, I mean, you've you've certainly overcome uh, that um, apprehension. Uh, in 2021 with a 127 million dollar series b uh, i think in early 20, 2020 150 million uh, us dollar and 127 uh, euro uh, euros uh, million euros yeah 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 which is uh that's incredible it's sizable you know it's it's definitely newsworthy it's um it's also it was happening uh during a, a period of time perhaps you know pre real tight kind of ca capital uh, i guess contraction, capital market contraction. Yeah. Um, thankfully, we're seeing some of that loosen up again here in the last few weeks. But, um, you know, you you went after that money and, and secured it uh, when, when things were not necessarily easy. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Like, what was what was that experience yeah. like? How did you how did you manage to, to pull that off? It, it was really different. And uh, I, I guess we 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 <laughs> we just did everything virtually in the uh, complete lockdown. So uh, we were in a world where we were not able to travel. We were not able to go to the US. Uh, and we had this really urge to uh, leverage on the data that we had generated in our phase one, two uh, trial. So we uh, we were granted a breakthrough therapy designation on uh, amazing data. They are uh, still the strongest data in first line melanoma as of today. So we have doubled up uh, on standard of care. And you know, to uh, really rush forward, we, we needed uh, to set up a phase three trial to uh, validate and uh, repeat the data that we had seen in phase one, two. So I contacted some of the uh, VCs I knew uh, already, uh, shared our update and our story and our plans for the future. And uh, it resonated well. And uh, fast forward, we were able to close a, a quite substantial uh, Series B round. And 10 months later, we did the IPO. So uh, yeah. it, it was really hard work, but also uh, able to be done in a, in a virtual setting. So that was fantastic. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations like mRNA and cell and gene therapies into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need to know topics for biopharma leaders. 
The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at Cytiva.com backslash Emerging Biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash Emerging Biotech. Yeah, definitely fantastic and, and timely. Again, given the given the fact that the last few months have not necessarily been pretty, uh, it must have given you some sense of confidence um, and assurance uh, that you've, you had the, the the runway and the you know the, the I guess the um, access uh, to to continue your work into these very pivotal uh, trials. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Tell us. Uh, I, I want to get into the an update on on your candidates, uh, but but first give us a little bit more on the science, the, the technology, what's the scientific rationale behind the effort and the, the T-WIN platform? Describe that for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so again, I, I, let me start and go back to the days at NIH, NCI, where those groups uh, working there and also what I became a part of was really uh, trying to work out uh, cancer vaccines. Uh, so vaccine strategies where you develop a T cell specific response in patients and then enable these T cells to really look out and kill cancer cells. I've always been attracted to that. And uh, what we know today is that uh, the lack of success in those uh, early efforts was really uh, the cancer cells themselves to fight back and uh, mediate a a strong uh, immune suppressive uh, network surrounding them. So what we are doing today, so fast forward again to uh, where we are with the uh, technology at iBiotech, is really that we are looking out not only to kill cancer cells with our cancer vaccine, but really to mediate a T cell uh, attack on the tumor microenvironment, which is really containing a lot of those problematic cells, if you like, uh, that makes uh, the uh, cancer cells able to grow. So when you first break down those barriers, you are able to mediate a stronger attack towards the cancer cells. So in a nutshell, what we are doing and what is different compared to other cancer vaccines is that we are targeting our vaccine towards the tumor microenvironment and the immune suppressive mechanisms as well as towards the cancer cells. So we are looking at both type of cells as one and we want to attack and address uh, both uh, cell types. So that's really the, the key uh, angle and the edge uh, with our technology. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah and the, and the, the pipeline itself has grown tr- pretty tremendously in, in just seven years. Uh, you've got, I think, eight, eight, eight studies. I, I don't know. It's just been a little while since I looked, but yeah. I think like eight studies, a candidate on the, on the cusp, as you said, of phase three trials in melanoma, six programs poised for phase two. Are those numbers still accurate right now? Yeah, so we have two basket trials in uh, phase two, uh, and um, they are with uh, three indication in each one of them. And then we have a phase uh, three trial as well. And then we have a a third target that is also bubbling and uh, on its way uh, up uh, in the pipeline. So it's it's really, I I mean, it's so exciting. You have a a very fantastic technology and it's just about getting it out to the patients, right? yeah, and I'm so you know when I when I talk with companies that uh, leaders of companies that have grown in in short order uh, to to have sizable pipelines, um, you know there 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 are different strategies that are uncovered in in the growth of those pipelines. You know sometimes it's uh, you know a, the the company is a, a drug hunter, right? Where we're, we've acquired our way to a robust pipeline, um, or you know we've uh, materialized it in, internally, or we've worked with several academic institutions to. Uh, pick up candidates at early stages. What what's sort of been the the strategy for IO Biotech to get to this point where you've got a, a robust pipeline, several targets, you know, several several uh, clinicals happening at the same time. Yeah. So so really, our lead product candidate I one and two I one and three is what is driving most of our clinical activity. This is a program where we are targeting IDO and PDL one mm-hmm. uh, in as a one product candidate. Uh, So we're vaccinating against those two uh, immune suppressive uh, proteins. Uh, And this is being tested both in uh, first line melanoma. Uh, This is also being uh, tested in a phase two basket trial, uh, three different indications, lung, head and neck and bladder cancer. And then we are setting up uh, also to test it in new adjuvant adjuvant settings. So this is really driving uh, a lot of the clinical activities. And 
for me, it's about testing the value of this product candidate that has shown so strong data in uh, melanoma. And with same targets being expressed in multiple other cancer indications, it makes a very sound rationale to test it also uh, in these uh, other uh, indications as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, when, when you talk about IDO and PDL one, uh, and you talk about melanoma, you know, I, pe people with a with a memory that goes back to pre COVID might remember that uh, Insights IDO drug uh, in combination with Keytruda for metatastic melanoma uh, had a failure in phase three. Um, and I, you know, I'm going to invite you to sort of compare and contrast. But the the bigger question here is, you know. When, when something like that happens and the industry sort of casts maybe a widespread net of doubt around a target, uh, for instance, uh, it creates, I, I would imagine, some headwinds for other companies who are working in the same space on the same targets. Um, and and th those headwinds, in effect, have to create more work for you and carving out your differentiation and your niche, right? Like, I know it's a, it's a tough question to ask, but I'm curious what your you know, what your reflection is on that, where there's perhaps general knowledge that there's been failure with, you know, that target and, and that indication in the past. Uh, how, how does that kind of create headwinds and how do you overcome the headwinds? Yeah, thank you. So first of all, uh, I still remember that day in April 2018, where those data come came out. I think we all do. It was, it was a very sad day for the community uh, in, in, in general. I think for, for the field of IO, it was really uh, so disappointing. We all had our hopes uh, held high uh, for the outcome of that trial. So it was really a, <laughs> a flat, uh, yeah, yeah, it was really a disappointment. For me personally, uh, I had uh, so many best wishes to go and found a new company uh, because many thought that that was the end of the day for iobiotic and uh, wishing me well and uh, and so on um, we thought through our mechanism of action and we thought through uh, how we were positioned compared to the small molecule inhibitors and we didn't change anything we didn't change anything based on those data our mechanism of action is completely different from what you see with the small molecule inhibitors. So mm -hmm. I, I won't sh say that it didn't shake us because of course it did. And we uh, spent time uh, looking through and understanding uh, our differentiation. Uh, but after that review, we, we have stayed strong on our plans. So we haven't changed uh, anything in our plans and our way to uh, address and uh, attack uh, idol. What I have changed is uh, all the questions I have needed to answer uh, based on the uh, idol's uh, failure back in uh, 2018. And as you are saying, being ready to really address our differences mm -hmm. and uh, how our data uh, have evolved and where we see that uh, we stand strong. So of course, this has been a question that comes all the time, not as much uh, now as uh, just after uh, the data read out, but it's still on top of uh, everybody's mind. When you say IDO, everybody remember <laughs> the read out in uh, 2018. Yeah. Um, what, what we have done, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm making this so long now, but no, uh, what we have done... <laughs> don't, don't apologize. It's, it's great color and it's exactly what I was looking for, you know, because like I said, I mean... I, you know, I'm not. I'm not questioning the legitimacy of the target or the or the therapeutic intent a, at all. Okay. I'm, I'm I'm asking you to help our audience understand how to make your way through a headwind like that because yeah. we see, you know, we see it all the time in in multiple therapeutic areas. We just saw yeah. it, you know, a year a year ago in in Alzheimer's, where every, everybody who was working on an Alzheimer Alzheimer therapeutic uh, suffered this the same blow, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I, you know, that this is exa exactly what uh, what I'm after. You know, how as the leader of the company do you um, obviously go out there and address, yeah, um, just what it is that 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 makes this a worthwhile fight while the rest of the industry is kind of frowning on it. Yeah, and and it all really boils down to data, right? So it's data that needs to to lead us and guide our decision making. Uh, at that time, we didn't have the data that we have now in the clinical setting. So uh, most of the data leaned back to the foundational data from the time when we uh, established uh, iBiotech. 
whatever we have seen uh, ever since those early days uh, when we founded the company and tested in different models with collaborators always have pointed in the same direction. We have a clear uh, data package that show us uh, that the effect that we anticipate is really also the effect we see in multiple different uh, models. And now we have seen it in patients as well. So it's, it's really a strong and good data package we have uh, in hand here. Yeah, as you were growing uh, during that time, just post 2018, uh, making making hires, you know, going out there on the fundraising trail. Obviously, that that did work out for you in in 21. Um, did you find yourself having to work twice as hard to say to potential candidates, uh, to potential you know uh, investors, like, no, 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 forget about what you just heard. You know, forget about yeah. that for a minute. And let let us tell you this is different, and here's why. Yeah. Did you have, have to work twice as hard to make that happen? I, I, I did. You, you have to build your story on what the reality have shown the world and, and definitely also uh, for us at iBiotech. So yes, I had to build my story uh, around those data and, and really uh, coming through uh, with credibility on our programs. Yes. Yeah. Also for employees and, and members of the team uh, joining us. Uh, yeah, certainly. Sure. Yeah. The scientific community that you sought to attract. Yeah. 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 You mentioned earlier, I think I, I mentioned it as well, that you're, um, you're addressing solid tumors of, in addition to melanoma. Uh, solid tumors of the lung, bladder, head, and neck with, uh, with your candidates IO2 and, and uh, I'm sorry, IO102 and IO103. Um, when I see that, you know, I have a sort of a naive and, and natural question around the ambition of these indications. You know, that's a pretty tall it's a it's a it's a it's a full plate i guess is how i put it so uh give us some insight into into why that is realistic why is it realistic for you to come out of the gate saying okay like we're going to tackle um you know all these solid tumors of, of multiple organs why is it why is it a potential reality so so uh, okay you never know anything before you see the data of your sure. trials right but uh, uh the the value of uh, of the programs uh or the, pro, the data that we have in first-line melanoma are really strong. And uh, in combination with NCPD1, there is a strong need for uh, benefit for uh, just a high number of patients in each of those indications that we have embarked on. We have reasons to believe that the uh, expression of the targets that we are uh, uh, using uh, is high in these indications. This has been shown uh, also scientifically. And therefore, it's meaningful for us to expand uh, and uh, test the value of our uh, lead program in, in these indications as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, yeah. Whenever, so whenever I, just a couple more questions, then I'll let you off the hook, uh, my Brett. I, uh, whenever I have a, a female founder, a female CEO, I, I like to get a little insight on you know, what, it, what it's like to be a female founder and, and CEO, maybe even in, in your specific geography um, and what advice you have for, for others who are, uh, you know, working towards, towards that goal, uh, because it's not often, right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a uh, an honor and a, and an infrequent privilege for me to be able to uh, interview a, a female CEO because there just aren't, aren't as many, as many of them as we, as we all well know. So what's, what's your place on that? Just do it. Yeah. Don't, don't don't think too much. Uh, I'm I'm a mentor for uh, some uh, yeah younger in, uh, aspiring uh, female CEOs. They are great. They're doing a good good job, and uh, we don't talk so much about being female and being uh, CEO. We are just talking about doing it. So uh, yeah. that's that's what it's about. Uh, as I, as I said, I didn't think much. I slept one night when I was uh, challenged first time to. Uh, uh, take the CEO uh, seat and of course I mean I also had uh, small children I a family to build and all those other matters that that female uh, of women or family have uh, we just didn't think we just did it so uh, if you have the passion and you have the wish it's just uh, just go and do it uh, and I make it sound easy but and it has not been it's been uh, quite a journey, but it's definitely been worth, uh, worth it. I would do it any day. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to, I know we're short on time. I'd like to ask you questions about what's, what's been difficult and particularly challenging, but, um, but, but I think I like the, I like the intent and the, I guess the intent and fortitude behind your simple statement. Just, just go, don't think, just go do it. That we'll, yeah. we'll leave it at that. We'll let that, we'll let that speak for itself. Cause I like that a lot. Yeah, that sounds good. What, uh, what, what's the next big step for IO? Well, for, before I ask you that, like what the, what the next big uh, step or move is for the company, what, what haven't I asked you that I should have, you know, from your perspective, I, I have this opportunity to talk with you. What, what, what should I have asked you that I haven't? So uh, I, I think that I'm very proud of us coming out of the Danish uh, biotech scene, but I'm also very proud of now building the company into the U S space. I think this is very important for where we are and also for the market uh, of our product candidates. Um, so the you next- said, You said real quick, you said you had two offices now in the in the States? Yeah, we have both in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, so very close to the uh, FDA and also on the NIH campus. So I'm coming back to, uh, again, to my early days. And then we have a, a corporate office uh, in the Alexandria building in uh, New York. Very pleased uh, about both uh, locations and we have great people working already in the US as well. Uh, and the next step for iBiotech, just like a general uh, uh, sentence is execution, execution and execution. So now we have raised all the money. Now we have to deliver uh, on our plans uh, and deliver both to patients and shareholders. Yeah, that's uh, ex excuse that uh, sparked a, a question that I should have asked you that that I didn't. So I'm going to ask you real quick now, uh, as it relates to execution of of the plan um, in your phase three clinical uh, that, that's coming up here. Uh, what are what is your what's your uh, sort of manufacturing environment look like? Are you are you guys manufacturing? For clinical supply in house, are you working with an outsourcer on that? What's what's the go forward plan? Yeah, we are we are working with CDMOs uh, both here in Europe and in the US. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with me, Dr. Zoka. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll keep an eye on those phase three trials, and hopefully, we'll uh, we'll have a, a revisit sometime where we can talk some some data and updates. Sounds good. Would be a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So that's IO Biotech President, CEO, and Founder, Dr. My Britt Zoka. I'm Matt Pillar, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online, which you can find intuitively at bioprocessonline.com, and where I encourage you to subscribe to my newsletter. We've been supported from day one by Cytiva, which offers a deep well of resources for emerging biopharma companies at its biotech accelerator at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Be sure to check that out. If you're enjoying these conversations with biotech innovators, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a review there. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>